Greetings, gang, and welcome back to Chapter 33 for your Chapter 33 lecture video on nuclear fission. Or, how it is that the nuclei of atoms split apart to make new elements and other high-energy reactions. <clears throat> so, we started to notice that uh, when we use cathode ray tubes at really high energies, they would pierce through solid materials or even human tissue, which is why we use it to map out bones and stuff on the inside of us. And I'm sure you already realize that I'm talking about x-rays, right? But we also discovered on accident that the plates that we use for x-ray photography would darken by themselves when left near a sample of the element uranium. This, of course, was not because of the x-rays, but because the energy that was released during what we call a radioactive decay event or a series of events. And that's this thing that we usually commonly refer to as radioactivity. Now it behooves us to discuss the various mechanisms by which an atom can decay from one element into another. And there are three major ones. There is an alpha particle, or an alpha emission, a beta emission, or a beta decay, and a gamma emission, or a gamma decay. The alpha decay is the emission of this thing that we call an alpha particle. So, let's say you have a nucleus, right? It has a bunch of particles in it, some protons, some neutrons, and it emits an alpha particle. Now, an alpha particle is two protons and two neutrons. So, if this nucleus emits these four particles, what's going to happen to the nucleus? Well, its atomic number is going to decrease by two, right? Because there are two protons in this alpha particle, this stable helium nucleus that's getting emitted here. He's a dork. Anyway, uh, I wanted you to know that uh, he was the one making the noise and not me. He likes to fumble around in that uh, cardboard cast particle. So uh, if you hear it again, you know what happened. Anyway, uh, the atomic number in this nucleus is going to decrease by two, right? So that's going to change the characteristics of our atom in general. And also, what's going to happen to the mass is, well, we've got two protons and two neutrons, which all have an atomic mass of about one, right? So it's going to lose in total four mass. That's what happens when some nucleus or some atom emits an alpha particle. Now, a beta emission is when some nucleus emits an electron. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's a funny thing because pro only protons and neutrons live in the nucleus of an atom, right? There aren't any electrons there. Well, how is this kind of thing possible then? Well, <clears throat> let's say you have a neutron. Now, if it were to become a proton, it could emit an electron and then the total charge here would still be zero, right? So a charge in the universe would be conserved if this neutron became a proton and emitted an electron. Well, that is exactly what happens. This neutron becomes a proton and emits an electron. So what's that going to do to the atomic number of this atom? Well, we've got a zero becoming a one, so we can very plainly see that what's going to happen inside the nucleus here is that we're going to gain one atomic number. What's going to happen to the mass? Well, what is going to happen to the mass? We've got a neutron that has about one atomic mass unit and a proton that has about one atomic mass unit, so the net change will be zero, right? Nothing happens. There is another kind of beta decay. This is your standard beta minus. Let me just draw it here just for completion. There's this other funny thing called a beta plus decay. Now this actually kind of happens pretty often.
So what happens in this kind of scenario is the positron becomes a neutron. Now we have a positive charge that has to go somewhere, right? And so it emits this funny thing called a positron, which is the positive counterpart, the antiparticle of the electron, this thing. Because these things are antiparticles, if they touch each other, they annihilate each other and release a bunch of energy. They are the antiparticle of each other, right? They're each other's antithesis. And that makes this an antimatter particle. Crazy stuff, right? In any case, <coughs> that's a beta plus decay. And that actually kind of happens a lot, but not spontaneously during radioactive decay all the time. In any case, that's also one of the types of beta decay. There are two. Also, there's this thing called gamma decay. And there are no gamma particles, per se. So gamma, the gamma radiation that turned Bruce Banner into the Hulk, in theory at least, was uh, basically just some energy. Because when an atom has an excess of energy in its nucleus, right, when there's just too much vibration or what have you in the nucleus, uh, some of that energy can get transferred to one or more of the electrons in the atom, causing the atoms to excite and de-excite and give off gamma rays, or really high energy electromagnetic radiation. Most of the radiation that we experience in our daily lives come from the radioactive isotopes in the atmosphere, uh, minerals, things like rocks, right? and from these funny things we call cosmic rays. Now I put a diagram for cosmic rays on the chapter 33 page and you can also find it in the class or the course files. Essentially, um, <coughs> those are high uh, energy radiation from distant stars in distant galaxies that result in highly energetic collisions when this electromagnetic radi radiation decays and the impact on particles in our atmosphere causing this really crazy high energy cascade of events. We end up with all these funny things called muons and pions, but suffice to say that it rains down a bunch of very high energy stuff causing interesting things like this beta plus decay event to happen that don't normally happen sort of spontaneously and on their own. There's a small amount of, uh, of, excuse me, radioactivity, the amount of food that we eat, a little bit from coal and nuclear plants. Um, if you live in like a stone, brick, or concrete house, then you're exposed to even more radiation because there's minerals in the rocks and so forth. And all of the minerals in our solar system have uranium in them because uranium is the heaviest stable element. And heavy elements were made back in the type two supernova when a high mass star exploded and left behind either a neutron star or a black hole that made up all of the material that made up our solar system and our sun and the planets and everything. We measure radiation with this sort of funny unit. This is the SI unit. And this thing called RADS. Oops, I accidentally used a red pen. Uh, I'm not writing the, this in red to try to give you guys anxiety, but uh, suffice to say that a rad of energy is about one hundredth of a joule. 0 0.01 joules of radiation energy each. However, there are different kinds of radiation, like we said before, alpha particles and beta particles, for example, that affect us in different ways. <coughs> Now, one electron has about one two thousandth of the mass of a proton or a neutron. And four protons and neutrons, four nucleons, right, which is what an alpha particle is made of, have 8,000 times as much mass as a beta emission, right, a beta particle. And so, long story short, the one half mv squared for alpha radiation causes alpha particle radiation to be about 10 times as harmful 
And if we take the physiological effects into account, radiation dosage is measured in these funny things called REMS. Not terribly unlike the kind of sleep cycle that you need to get in order to feel rested, REMS. Now one rad of alpha radiation, one rad of alpha radiation is 10 REMS. But one rad of beta radiation is only one rem of radiation dosage. We need about 500 rems of radiation dosage to have a 50-50 chance of dying from a whole body or a full figure, if you will, dose. <coughs> Sometimes we use 200 rems or so radiation to try to treat cancer. Because remember, you, you guys know what that's called? If you said chemotherapy, you would be correct. Normal dosage from the environment is something like 360 millirems or 0 0.360 rems. When some of that radiation damage causes damage to DNA, it can cause a mutation, which, believe it or not, is how everything this far has, re has evolved. Now, this is maybe a long shot, but if you've ever had to put a tracer into your bloodstream because you were like in an accident, you had something really nasty happen to you, sometimes they put a really small dose of radiation like into your bloodstream, and at night you can see like your veins and stuff glow. In any case, the smaller the dose, of course, the less harmful it is. Uh, people usually use that just to make sure that like your blood flow is actually working and so on. In any case, the nucleons, the particles in the nucleus that make up atoms, those of course are protons and neutrons, are made of particles called quarks, like we said before. These and leptons, like the electron, make up pretty much all of the matter. Nucleons stay together in the nucleus, but all the protons are positively charged. Now, if you have a bunch of particles that are either neutrally charged, and just for the sake of brevity here, I'm going to say that the neutrally charged ones are the blue neutrons and the positively charged particles are the red protons. Now if you've got just a whole bunch of these particles all together here, for example, how is it possible that if all these red particles are positively charged, how is it possible for it to keep this structure? Well, they should push each other apart, right? Well, there's this thing called the strong nuclear force, which is one of the four forces in nature. There's the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the electrostatic or electromagnetic force, and gravity, right? Now, the strong nuclear force is actually stronger in many stable configurations than this electrostatic repulsion force, or what we call the weak nuclear force. More positive charges or heavier elements means, of course, that you need more neutrons in the mix here in order to keep them far enough apart that the strong nuclear force can hold the atom together. As we saw in lab last week, <coughs> different elements take differing amount of time to decay. The characteristic time that it takes for half of a sample to decay is this thing that we call a half-life, which, strangely enough, is also usually denoted by a lowercase Greek letter lambda, just like wavelength. Some elements decay quickly, like billionths of a second, and some are long, like uranium, taking decaying into lead. So the half-life of uranium is actually something like 4.5 billion years, a long time. This is uh, actually, I think this is uranium-238. The half-life of carbon-14, on the other hand, is 5,000, I think it's 370 years. And this is the basis for carbon dating. 
Now, the way this works <coughs> is that every 5,370 years, the amount of carbon-14 in a fresh sample of carbon degrades by half. So, you start out with a certain amount of carbon. After 5,370 years, half of it decays. You're left with half. After another 5,370 years, half of that decays, and you have a quarter left. After another 5,370 years, or three half-lives, you lose half of that half, and you have an eighth remaining. After another 5,000 years, or four half-lives, that's a little over 20,000 years, you have one-sixteenth, right? So that's a half, times a half, times a half, times a half. Two, four, eight, sixteen, one-sixteenth remaining. Now, uranium-238, if we're going to map out its decay process, and I've included in the course files a mapping of the decay process, right? So let's start up here. This will be like atomic number on this scale. We're going to start with a 92 here, and we'll start here with a mass. Um, Actually, I guess we could just go by number of protons. Uh, I think there's something like... Um, I want to say 90... No, it's 92 protons. That's right. Um, let me look it up real quick. It's 146. So when we start we're here with 146, this is the number of neutrons. So we're going to start here with uranium 92, uh, element number 92. This is uranium 238. Now when uranium 238 begins its decay process, the first thing that, that's going to happen is that it's going to decay into thorium 234. TH for thorium, uh, it's going to lose two uh, neutrons, right, making it 144, excuse me. And it's also going to go down here to element 90, which is thorium. And then it's going to undergo two beta decays, right? The beta decay, of course, is going to take one neutron and make it into a proton. So we're going to lose one more neutron, and it's going to gain one electron. It's going to become, at this point, um, this is proactinum, P-A. And then it's going to emit another beta particle, right? It's going to undergo another beta decay event in order to go back to uranium, but this time it's going to be uranium-234. because by that time it's already lost 143, 142, right? It's lost a total of four neutrons, but it's come back to the same atomic number. At that point, it's going to decay into thorium again, but this time it's going to be thorium-230, and then it'll go on to become radium-226, It's actually, yeah, or, or I think it's all right. Radium-226, and then radon-222, and then polonium-218, right? 22 minus 4 is 18. And so on, it'll decay into lead, bismuth, polonium, and then lead, mis lead bismuth, bismuth, polonium again until finally it settles on a stable isotope of lead, which is lead-206. So that's an example of how something decays. Usually it starts with something heavier and eventually you end up with something lighter, but also stable. <coughs> now carbon dating is possible because a cosmic ray forces a neutron into the nucleus of the nitrogen-14 atom, making it into a carbon by ejecting a proton. Then over the course of time, the carbon-14 decays into a nitrogen-14 by beta decay. We get our carbon-14 from the environment, 
and the atmosphere and so on. So when we stop interacting with the atmosphere, that is to say when we stop breathing, we stop replenishing our one in a trillion carbon-14 concentration and allow it to decay, hence carbon dating. Both alpha and beta decay give off electrically charged what we call ions, if you remember those are part uh, particles which are not electrically neutral. As a result we can track radioactive decay events by the ionization of media in the region of space near that decay event. For example, the Geiger counter works by detecting the ionization of gas in an enclosed cylinder. When the gas ionizes, the free electrons are attracted to a charged wire which generates a current which activates a device that makes a clicking sound. There are a few other things, cloud chamber, bubble chamber, sparks chamber, and scintillation chamber which use various other methods. They'll make like streaks through ionized gas or um, bubbles or sparks in between parallel plates that uh, every other one is grounded and so it makes like a little electric arc not terribly unlike uh, like a small lightning bolt or something along those lines and through these various mechanisms they can show that one of these decay events is actually happening in any case that's about the end of the story here for nuclear fission I will see you in chapter 34 for a rundown on nuclear fusion.